Uh, let me introduce our uh, moderator today. Gerard Ryan is partner and head of the corporate division at Everton Sutherland Law Firm, as I've mentioned. Evelyn Sutherland are one of the most uh, significant law firms in these parts, and we're delighted to have their support in this series and more at the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. Gerard is a partner in the corporate department and has extensive transaction experience and expertise in uh, right across the landscape of, of corporate law and M&A, uh, venture capital, private equity, and um, foreign direct investment, uh, subject of some of our conversation today, and matters around corporate governance. Uh, he has lectured and delivered um, uh, uh, important uh, treatises uh, on these topics uh, to numerous uh, professional bodies, including the Law Society. Uh, and he's also, importantly, for a cause that concerns us dearly, a board member of the Ireland, Fun Ireland Funds, as, as most people on this call will know, Ireland Funds is uh, probably Ireland's most important um, international philanthropic body supporting causes uh, that are worthy of that support in Ireland and indeed around the world. So, Jared, with thanks to you and to your colleagues at Evershed Sutherland, once again, I'm going to hand the Zoom microphone and the Zoom lens to you. Kermagat. Thanks, John, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks on behalf of Everest Sutherland and British Irish Chamber of Commerce for joining us today. Um, we're all looking forward to what I think will be a huge insightful session um, on the global economy um, as we are now hopefully uh, moving out of the pandemic. I'd like to extend my sincere thanks um, to one of the world's leading economists, Dr. Adam Posen, for so generously taking the time to be with us here today. Um, I'm sure you're as eager as I am to hear Dr. Posen's views on where he thinks we're headed, um, the outlook for the global markets, uh, the econ economic implications of the Biden administration, and of course, um, what he thinks Brexit means for, for, for us and for our, our, our neighboring island. Um, over his career, Dr. Posen has contributed to research and public policy regarding monetary and fiscal policies, the challenges of European integration since the adoption of the Euro uh, and China-US economic relations. He is president of the globally renowned Peterson Institute for International Economics. He has also served as an external voting member of the Bank of England's Rate Setting Monetary Policy Committee and has held seven, seven terms in the panel of economic advisors to the US Congressional uh, uh, Budget Office. His commentary and notable articles have been published in many leading news and policy publications. And the last 18 months have certainly delivered in terms of challenges. Um, We've seen you know, the implications of Brexit, the largest trade disruption since the EU was formed, and then the devastation of, of COVID-19. Um, while the world is still in a state of flux, we're now looking forward with positivity. Um, in Everset Sutherland, I think we've differentiated ourselves through our international capability. Uh, being the Irish firm within, within Everset Sutherland, um, we've seen, I suppose, business activity um, over the last year start to start to come back. Um, we've you now worked with our international colleagues um, you know, and, and leveraged that, that, that international expertise. We have 74 offices in 35 jurisdictions. So as I say, we're starting to see activity come back. We're helping our clients across a wide range of sectors. Um, we've seen a growth, for, for example, in financial services. Um, we've also seen a, a real move and a focus from our clients in ESG and sustainability. Um, again, my own view would be that you know, the last 18 months, two years, um, and, and COVID-19 will probably accelerate that trend and highlights the, the vulnerability of, of what was our normal. So, so to, to sum it up, I think we're, we're looking forward to restored confidence in our global economy, a return to ease of trading with the UK, while we successfully manage the, the pandemic's many legacies, including the future of work. That all being said, I'm hoping uh, sorry, Dr. Posen may, may, may let me down very gently and, and tell me why I'm wrong and, and, and why maybe the, 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 the positivity maybe is misplaced or, or, or what we can look forward to. So we're looking forward to what he has to say um, and he brings with him such insight and experience that I think we, we, we're all looking forward to it. So with that, I'll hand you over to, to Dr. Posen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to Evershed Sutherland uh, for supporting this event as, as well as the Jared for the generous introduction. I'm grateful to the chamber uh, for having me. I've been engaged with UK and to a lesser degree Irish economic policy for nearly two decades now. Um, I had the privilege to serve on the Bank of England NBC during the financial crisis, not that the crisis was a privilege, of course. Um, 
and have been involved in discussing and analyzing Brexit. Uh, uh, my colleague, Patrick Conahan, the former governor of the Central Bank of the Republic of Ireland, I think is well known to many of you and is one of our fellows at the Peterson Institute. And so we do care, <laughs> um, I personally. And, and so picking up on what John and Gerard said, um, I think the, the positivity is well-founded, but there are other things going on as well. I mean, so just to start, um, as a number of senior officials have said rightly, vaccine policy is economic policy right now. And because Western Europe and the EU in general has with many fits and starts done effectively a good job of vaccinating the populations, um, including the UK, including Ireland. Um, your return to growth is all but assured. And, and the policies that were enacted by the Western economies and some of the Asian economies in terms of an aggressive response to what was a temporary unprecedented shock and doing this through more generous than usual unemployment benefits or in Europe furlough policies that, that kept people connected to their jobs even as, as demand cut back temporarily. These have been proven very successful. And I'm happy to talk about debt sustainability and fiscal macro issues. Um, that's what I spend, I and my team spent a lot of our time on. But I think the emphasis, at least in my opening, will be on uh, issues of trade, commerce, and Brexit. Um, and we can come back to those matters. But just to say that on a very fundamental level, the, the growth prospects for, for Ireland, for the EU, and to a lesser degree, but still fundamentally for the UK, um, are solid for the next couple of years. And, and despite what's obviously going on at the moment, um, I, th I think there is good reason for confidence. What has, of course, changed in Brexit and the relations over Northern Ireland and the Irish border um, is, is, is one particular instance of this, is that we have seen a real turn against globalization in the US uh, and to a lesser degree in the UK and some other significant world economies. And the degree of international agreement and openness outside of Europe and outside of Europe's bilateral relations has gone down quite a bit. Um, as you can see from my gray beard, I've been in this field or this game quite a while now. Um, you know, there have been throughout my lifetime, long before I even started working on this, there were recurring bestsellers every few years there would be somebody writing a book that the world is breaking down into trading blocks. In the 60s, it was Europe versus the US. In the 70s, it was Japan versus the US, or the Soviet Union versus the US. In the 80s, it was definitely Japan. In the 90s, briefly, they stopped worrying about that. And then now, of course, it's China versus US. Um, to use the old saw, the stop clock is right twice a day. This is the first time in my life, in my 30, professional, 30 years of professional work, when I think the best, the, whoever's writing that version of the bestseller right now is correct. Um, there are real movements underway to break the world economy up more into blocks. And, um, and the COVID pandemic, of course, has increased this because you have people saying quite understandably, oh boy, we're too reliant on resources from this, that, or the other country. Or if we have vaccines, we don't really want to share them. We want to make sure our people get injected first, or that we need more resilience in our supply chains, or that we need to have more checks at the border and worry about disease. All of these things, which are understandable, if it's somewhat exaggerated impulses, um, are feeding into the, the breaking up of the world economy, or breaking up is too strong. But what I've referred to in the past is the corrosion of globalization, um, that the many layers of connections that the world's economies have are unevenly being eroded, that there are holes in them, there are gaps, there are some places where one part of the connection remains, but some of the other strands have come undone. I'll be a little less cosmic and tangible in a moment. But the main point is that globalization and, and global commerce isn't just about trade. 
And nowhere more than on the Irish-British border can you see this. It's about movement of people. It's about movement of ideas. It's about mutual recognition of standards. It's about brands. It's about flow of ideas, very importantly. It's, it's about flows of investment. It's not just trade. And people tend to focus excessively, in my view, on um, basically stuff you can drop on your foot, who's doing steel, who's, or, in, or who's, who's doing cans of milk. Um, that matters. But for long run growth and stability, actually, it's the investment ties, the human ties, the business relationships, the flow of ideas and people that matter more. And in fact, trade is the most resilient part of the system, because even if it gets diverted from the most efficient to the most free way it will go, in the end, think of all the failures of blockades and sanctions going back to Napoleon trying to starve Britain. The trade gets through. It may be less efficient. It may be not as much variety as you would like, or as, but eventually the trade gets through. What gets disrupted lastingly are um, the networks and the standards and understanding and trust that goes with them. And that's what I'm particularly worried about in the China-US conflict and the way that the EU and other countries like the UK are going to have to be forced to make choices. Now, let me be very clear. I have no love for the Chinese Communist Party leadership. Um, and I do sincerely believe they are engaged in terrible human rights violations against Uyghurs and other Muslims in China. Um, but from an economic point of view, there is then the question of what do you do about that and how do you react? And if rightly, in my view, um, no one's going to go to war inside China to look after these people, and it would be insane to do so, the question is, how do you cope with China? And I think a lot of the issues uh, that are being raised about Chinese behavior, subsidies, intellectual property theft, and so on, they're real, but they're, they, they would not in and of themselves actually be that big a deal, to be honest from an economic perspective. But when it's put in this human rights, foreign policy perspective, and, and very much sense of fear that a lot of people in the US and to a lesser degree, people in the UK and Ireland have, uh, then it gets bound up into other things. Um, and so that's where you start getting things where countries are being asked in a sense, choose sides. And the real question for the EU is how much they're going to be forced to choose sides rather than continue relations economically with both sides between US and China. And this goes back to my corrosion of globalization. The, the, the destruction economic terms is not so much going to be about trade because so you move some production out of China to Vietnam or Mexico or you end up, if you're a headquartered company or even a small company, you end up deciding I'm going to do one line of production that fits with Chinese standards, and one line of production for North America and or for Europe, and there's a bit of redundancy and inefficiency, but in the end, you make it work. Or I'm a small business that can't make that decision, so I try to pick up uh, market share at home because Chinese products are being more excluded, and I and in return, I'm losing market share in China. Again, I, I don't want to trivialize this, but it, the, this kind of adjustment is doable. Um, it is the breakdown in the longer term investments and, and connections of business and cross-border activities of the non-goods trade that, that are really going to be damaging because over time, in my view and his, of history, that becomes self-reinforcing. That, that leads to more and more, you do stuff just for the Chinese market or the Chinese market does stuff just for itself. The North Americans do that and the Europeans may or may not be able to straddle that. Um, and over time that erodes not just markets, but it erodes productivity growth because there's less competition, there's less free flow of innovation and ideas, um, there's less economies of scale, there's more waste 
in an economic sense, so even though from a security sense, it may be sensible in terms of redundant investment. So let me now take it to two practical things that I think, I hope will be of direct interest to this group. Um, I hope what I said already was of some interest, but anyway, let me try to, to take it. So there's a lot of question about how different is the Biden administration on trade, on international commerce, on relations with the UK and Europe from the Trump administration. And I'm not the only one saying this, but I am a very well-informed observer on this particular point. And I regret to say that the distance between the Biden administration and the Trump administration on international economic policy and associated issues is small, much smaller than I expected, even though I had warned people I expected the Biden administration to continue a lot of the Trump behavior. And so it's not just that they continue to resent China and fear China and want to be tough with China. It is that they seem to only be paying lip service to the issues of alliances. They seem to be only very modestly being less confrontational and dismissive than the Trump administration were of allies. That they seem to really prioritize um, people doing military support gestures for US foreign policy preferences and letting those priorities determine a lot of economics. They seem to be very happy. I should stop using seem. I have spoken with some of the senior officials in the administration as well as their public. They are very happy with the use of tariffs um, and not using them solely at China, but against others. Um, yesterday, I believe it was, Catherine Tai, the US trade representative, member of President Biden's cabinet, gave what was supposed to be her conceptual first big speech of this administration. And it's very clear that they intend to continue as much as possible of the, of the Trump approach. They pay lip service to allies and they have no real plans, no coherent strategic plans for how to deal with allies vis-a-vis -vis China and the economic problem. Uh, they are in addition on the migration side, um, being not as barbaric and intentionally cruel perhaps as the Biden people, but they are maintaining in place a number of extreme anti, not just migration, but anti-immigration stands that the uh, Trump people have put in place. Um, they, the one place they haven't been as bad on this front as I feared was that they haven't yet put in a very extended regime of uh, trade controls and sanctions to try to prevent transfer of technology to China. There's some. I was expecting that was gonna be their big emphasis. They haven't yet done that. Um, and maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, obviously the more they do that, the more disruptive that is for European, including UK companies that are, or Japanese or Korean or Singaporean or Australian companies that are trying to do business in both China and the US. And we've seen this with Venezuela, with Cuba, with Iran sanctions, it just, so just imagine how difficult this is in China. Um, the Biden administration, as we were briefly chatting before the start of this event, is deeply committed to the Good Friday Agreement and to Ireland. That is partly a matter of President Biden and House Speaker Pelosi's personal views, but it is very widely backed in the society and in the political sphere. Um, so the Johnson administration, or the Johnson government, I should say, excuse me, in, in the UK has only pipe dreams uh, about bilateral trade deals with the US or joining NAFTA or any of that stuff. Um, so let me now finally go to Brexit, which I know is a multifaceted issue and is felt very, very keenly by the people on this call and your families and your employees and your constituents. Um, so if you go back, I was one of many economists um, out there talking about Brexit back in 2016, 2017, uh, ahead, of, ahead of and right after the first referendum. Um, and sadly, essentially everything I and a few others forecast has come to pass. I, I did not forecast 
empty supermarket shelves and shortages of petrol in, in the British Isles, um, or in that part of Britain, I should say. Um, but I did forecast lack of resilience, um, lack of per uh, diminished purchasing power uh, of the pound vis-a-vis uh, -vis globally traded goods, uh, very unequal collapse of exports from the UK to Europe versus Europe to the UK, particular shortages in agriculture and so on and so on and so on. So I was grimly amused to see Kirsty Alsop, who I used to watch with very mixed feelings pre-Brexit in uh, UK TV, very publicly tweeting today about, oh my God, I can't get any gas. It's a terrible situation. And everybody on Twitter is like, well, Kirsty, what's the situation? Uh, what did you advocate for? Um, so joking aside, you know, the, the both ultimately, as I said in my somewhat famous video about Brexit, one of the big issues, there are two big drivers of why it's going so badly. Brexit for the UK is first geography in the form of what economists call gravity matters, that you trade most with the people and who are close to you geographically and who you've historically had the most interactions with. And there's no substituting declaring a trade war on your closest neighbors. And second, that opting out of the single market um, which is all the things beyond tariffs, all the questions of standards, and I know the law firm never shed Sutherland and others are well aware of this, all, all the issues of legal agreements and common standards and mutual recognition and the paperwork, all of those really matter and in fact matter as much or more than, more matter more frankly than the tariffs. Um, and so, and that's what's happened. And so unfortunately, of course, the Irish-British border is the place where all these things come together. And I remember when I was on the MPC, at one point I did a visit, regional visit to Northern Ireland, and I'm sure this is trite to all of you, but was very striking to me, was going to this big supermarket with a car park on the border where one car park was in Ireland and one car park was in Northern Ireland and people were meeting in the supermarket and both sides were shopping, you know, and, and just the idea that there was going to be a cleavage there was just leaving aside even the politics of the, the Good Friday Agreement and all that was just insane uh, from an economic point of view. And, and so when you look at geography and history and institutional standards and business networks and all these things that I've said throughout and throughout my 15 minutes, uh, are the things that really matter. There is no good option right now uh, for what's going to happen on that border. Uh, and again, you all know this, but it, it just has to be repeated. You, you either create a, a much stiffer economic border to go with the political border, um, which is the only way you can avoid smuggling and disruption and other issues um, from an economic point of view, or you do as you're doing now and have Northern Ireland be on the other side of the economic border. And as we can see, um, that has enormous economic benefits for Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the UK, um, as opposed to, in addition to, excuse me, um, avoiding some terrible disruptions. And so, regrettably, from an economic point of view, um, the, the current situation is very difficult to see as being sustained. Um, so either the UK has to basically live with the fact that Northern Ireland becomes much more attractive to others, although with a lot of uncertainty, deterring overinvestment. And it's like a, a free, you know, 30 years ago in China, they created a free economic opportunity zone in Shenzhen. Um, and instead of the leveling up the British government talks about, the, the particular zone that has special access to the EU does better than the rest of the country. Uh, or um, you do a huge amount of economic pain imposed on the people of Northern Ireland and 
with spillover, meaningful spillovers on Ireland and the UK uh, in order to maintain the political war. And again, I, you know, I fear about talking about such things to this audience and people know it well, but it's just, and maybe it's useful for you to have somebody who's coming from the outside, just sort of affirming that's the reality. And so when people ask me, um, barring very strange political events, it seems to me that five to 10 years down the road, uh, we're looking at Irish unification because the, the economic forces at work are just not gonna be reconcilable with the political situation. And the political situation, if you have such, you end up imposing very obvious economic costs on the people, I'm not sure it's sustainable either. So uh, circling back to Gerard and John and wanting to end on a happier note, um, the good news is that, you know, if God willing, despite all the divisions in the world economy, we continue to have peace and which I'm hopeful we will. Uh, and I mean, peace both where you are and peace US China, peace in general for the rich world. Um, I think over time, just as has happened in the past, the UK will have to find its way back to Europe, um, whether formally or informally or whatever it's gonna, EFTA is gonna become. Um, and that over time, the uh, fundamental historic and commercial ties between Ireland and, and Great Britain will be more important than the temporary disruptions, although the temporary disruptions may last several years. So I hope that was enough to interest people and maybe uh, provoke some questions and conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Posen. That, that, was, that was really interesting, and 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 I think we've, we've all um, learned a lot there. I think there's going to be some time time for some questions now. So, um, just to kick it off, I suppose uh, I have a couple of couple of questions. I suppose we live in an in an era of um, ultra crepidarianism where everybody's an expert, um, and I think one of the signs of maybe the pandemic ending is that all the people who became, uh, you know experts on 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 the pandemic have now you know uh, moved back towards being economists again i know in a in a recent you know new york times article in which you were quoted um the, the article kind of talks about the fact that despite very intelligent people um studying economics and macroeconomics for a number of centuries it remains very much a, a black box so i suppose of a two-part question um the, the, the question is with that in mind, and given the complexity of, of the global economic system, um, how do mainstream policymakers and central banks decide what to focus on? And then the second part of that question would be, um, in particular, what does that mean for the economic theory that public fears of uh, inflation are self-fulfilling? And what's your view in terms of the, the current temporary, or sorry, the, 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 the kind of current surge of inflation? Is that likely to be uh, an ongoing thing or is it temporary? Thank you. Um, so central banks, let's start with central banks and then talk a bit about finance industries and elected officials. Um, central banks claim and in their own self-image think that they basically worry about inflation and then subject to inflation worries, they try to keep employment up and financial instability down in that order. Um, and slightly, that's broadly what they think they're doing and trying to do. Slightly uh, more realistically, as pointed out by Ben Bernanke 15 years or so before he became Fed chair, um, central banks do actually sort of a firefighting theory. They deal with inflation if inflation's high, and then if inflation isn't high, something else crops up and they deal with that. And, and so a lot of it is more reactive and, and pragmatic than they're often held to be. I mean, there are exceptions. There are central banks that uh, ideologically, like the Bundesbank used to, or the Bank of Japan, commit themselves to inflation fears above all else. And oftentimes they get bad results, but mostly central banks are running from thing to thing, but if they're forced to choose, they wanna keep inflation under control. And, um, 
one of the good things about central banks is that people do genuinely try to learn over time. That's really what central bank independence and technocrats rather than elected officials get you. Um, so you had mentioned earlier the very big difference between the way central banks and finance ministries responded to this pandemic crisis in terms of scale and speed of the response versus what happened in 2008, 9, 10. Um, and that I think reflects genuine positive learning on the part of central banks and ministers that the austerity didn't work, um, that it is possible to do things quickly and affordably, and that it will make a material difference to people's well being. And so we saw unemployment go up much less in the UK than in the US, and much less in Ireland than in the UK, and less than they did during the last crisis. And it also reflects some changes in financial regulation, which again, we're learning and improving. Um, so I, I think there's that going on as to what they do. And so a lot of understandable skepticism as well as crazy conspiracy theories assume there's all kinds of motivations there, but it, it, it's really, that's roughly what people do when you're inside the room. Um, finance ministries to a lesser degree follow the same path. They're somewhat influenced by the same things, and they definitely have more of a firefighting pragmatic view, but they are, um, of course, subject much more to politics. And uh, we're seeing this to very great uh, damage in the US right now in terms of our budget situation and the partisanship fed by the Republican senators to uh, block a normal budget process. So now turning to inflation, um, what I've been writing about inflation in the US, which applies to some degree, but less amplitude to UK and Euro area, is that um, we're undergoing a one-time big shift in labor markets. And there's a lot of things going on. People are reevaluating their relationship to work. Employers are reevaluating how they do work, what employees they need. There's a big shift between sectors, people doing in-person retail, restaurants, agricultural picking, healthcare uh, at the low level of being an aid, not low level of quality, but I mean in terms of income, of being healthcare aides and orderlies. They're all reevaluating. And so there's a lot of structural change in the labor markets. And so where the Fed or the Bank of England or others were talking about a short-term transitory shock. Um, to me, it's still transitory, but transitory means more like two to three years than three to nine months. So I think inflation will still be up well above 3% towards 4% in the US through 2022. I think inflation will be slightly higher than what many people are expecting for the Euro area. Um, but I don't think this is the start of some 70s, 80s type wage price spiral. It's just gonna last longer than people want and the central banks, because of what we just said earlier about firefighting and being worried primarily about inflation, may overreact because when we get to a year from now and say in the US, inflation's coming in still starting with a three instead of a two, they may get more anxious about raising rates than they possibly need to be. Um, the UK, of course, is in a particular situation. And the one piece of my forecasts about the economic effects of Brexit that has repeatedly not been right, um, was I expected the pound to suffer a lot more than it did, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the euro, because I viewed Brexit as forcing my colleagues at the Bank of England to essentially go partway back to the 70s, that they can't just easily stabilize the economy the way they could under inflation targeting. They have to worry more about the external effects or people pulling money out of um, the UK. I think the combination of factors we're seeing now with the very high spikes in inflation in the UK are finally bringing forward what I was worried about. And so that idiosyncratic to the UK, unlike the US, unlike Western, the Euro area, I should say, excuse me, um, there's more perceived risk that inflation will stay high and will spike higher than in other places. And that constrains the ability of the Bank of England to be accommodating. And so I do think there's increasing risk the Bank of England will have to raise rates in a time when other central banks will not. 
I hope that was responsive to your question. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Very well. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, thanks, Anna. That, that, that answered very well. Um, I'd now like to invite um, Denise Walsh, who's Group Strategic, Group Strategic Finance Projects Manager at Lakeland Dairies. Uh, she, Denise, you, you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, Dr. Posen. Yes, I do. First of all, I'd like to thank the Chamber and Evershed Sutherland for giving us the opportunity to listen to Dr. Posen today. Um, I have two questions here. One you've just um, nearly covered off on the euro sterling rate, on what you think your views are, where it's going to go in the short and medium term. Yeah, I think as well as medium term, basically sterling has to go down against euro um, because they've, you've essentially, not you, the UK has essentially imposed a trade war on itself with its largest trading partner. And so that creates an imbalance that they, they can't easily make up for. And so the only way to make the books balance is that sterling weakens and that helps make up for other things. Otherwise, UK has to just borrow much more in order to pay for the goods it's importing from the EU because it'll be exporting less to the EU. And for some amount of time, you can do that. And that's arguably why my currency forecast the last couple of years has been wrong, is that the UK has had much more extended credit of the inflows into its real estate market and other things than, than I was expecting. But I think the tide's turning. And so medium term, meaning, you know, medium term to me is one and a half to five years is what I call the medium term. And medium term, I think sterling has to be weak, significantly weaker against euro. Short term, obviously my forecasts are wrong, so I'm not gonna try to say short term. <laughs> That's okay. And the second question I have for you is, um, it's on the Northern Ireland Protocol, and I suppose you believe that Northern Ireland can have the best of both worlds because of the Northern Ireland Protocol? I believe if the UK and Irish governments can figure out a way to agree to that, yes, you can, Ireland, Northern Ireland can have the best of both worlds. The question is whether London and other political actors, including the, the DUP and you know, again, I'm not going to pretend to lecture you all on this, but basically, if there are resentments that come up that Northern Ireland actually outperforms, on econ visibly outperforms on economic matters, and that doesn't induce invoking Article 16 or something else like that, there's no economic reason why, the, why Northern Ireland couldn't have best of both worlds. I just think operationally and politically, I'm not sure how long you can anybody can sustain that situation. Having a, 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 an ongoing sort of mismatch between where your political border and your economic border is, it's not impossible, but it requires a lot of good faith on both sides. And, and, and it requires a lot of political maturity of people on both sides of the border not to be resentful or gloat. Um, so putting it very crudely. So I would hope they could make that work, but I, I, as I said, my forecast is I don't, I'll, I'll, out several years. I'm not sure how long we could make that work. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, Dr. Posen. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Dermot O'Leary, who's Chief Economist, Investment Banking with Good Body. Um, I know, Dermot, you have a question you'd like, you'd like to um, ask. Thanks, Dr. thanks Jared. Um, <clears throat> and thanks, Adam. Uh, your views are interesting, as, as always. My question is around the politics of trade in the US. Um, you know, you rightly pointed out that the Biden policies are not that different to Trump's, especially in relation to to, to China. Um, you may have read uh, an article by Martin Wolf and the FT recently called "The Strange Death of American Democracy," uh, and he was talking about the differences across the aisle. And trade seems to be the one thing that's kind of common. Um, what do you think is behind that, and, and do you do you agree with that? And and is it a vote winner, which which means it it'll continue to be kind of pushed uh, over the next number of years? And does it go beyond China in relation to kind of these more hardline tactics around trade uh, to traditional partners of the U.S.? Thank you, Dermot. Um... Sorry, I was just making sure I was unmuted. Uh, thank you, Dermot. They, yeah, and I've actually been corresponding a bit with Martin, Martin Wolf about his views on this, um, which I think are quite insightful as usual. 
Um, yes, there does seem to be a common denominator across the two parties in the trade sphere. Um, it's not universal, but it's pretty widespread. And that's part of why arguably even some people in the Biden administration who are not necessarily convinced of their anti-trade views feel they have to do it because the Congress or parliament is vociferously anti-trade in both parties. Um, as I wrote about in an article I published in Foreign Affairs in April, um, which is called The Price of Nostalgia, um, I would make a few points. Uh, the first is that as often is the case, um, what's politically popular is not necessarily reality-based. So the US, so the political reality that people have been anti-trade and both parties in the US is, is very real. And the result is that actually the US has been withdrawing from globalization for 20 years under both parties. So you go back and you look at the record, whether it's Ireland or China, France or Japan, um, almost every country in the world and certainly every rich country has been getting more globalized over the last 20 years. A share of trade and GDP has gone up. A uh, number of immigrants entering the country has gone up. Amount of foreign direct investment as a share, just as a flow basis has gone up. In the US, all of these are flat to down. Uh, the share of trade and GDP has been basically flat. It's gone up, went up very slightly at a fraction of the rate of others and then flattened. Um, immigration has gone backwards. Foreign direct investment has been flat in nominal terms and therefore shrinking in real terms as a share of the economy. So the US has been anti-globalization effectively for 20 plus years, but it remains popular in the Congress. Whether the American people actually feel that is very questionable. So even though people in both parties will insist that the reason Trump won and then Biden won in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or these particular formerly industrialized states that are seen as swing votes in the presidential and congressional elections, they'll say it's partly in large part because he's standing up for the middle class, standing up against China and all this. But it's not really there in the polling data. Um, so it, for years, you know, we have various polling firms that ask variants of the question, what do you think is the most important issue facing the US or facing you right now? Or they offer 10 issues and say, which one, how do you rank these? Okay, so we've got a very long time series of these surveys. And trade never makes it into the top five and rarely is in the top 10. And I, I'm choosing those words accurately, never is in the top five. I mean, basically, if you go back to 1985, with the height of the Japan mania, you can find a brief period where trade was in the top five. That's it. And so, the, 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 though it's this received wisdom in Washington that the trade issue and the anti-trade, anti-globalization views are a vote getter, it's not clear that's really true. So then they say, well, maybe it's you're posing your, your clueless, you don't understand. It's all about these particular congressional districts or these particular parts of these states. And even there, it's not as evident as they make it out to be because the, the sheer numbers of people losing their jobs and which communities are hurt, it's not really well supported. And the US is increasingly just out of line with UK, Ireland, other countries, both in terms of attitudes and in terms of economic integration. So, I mean, there's two ways of looking at this. One is to say, okay, this is just the genuine belief of a wide range of American politicians and therefore it can persist and be very bad for a long time. And the other way is to say, at some point the politicians are gonna have a wake up call because this is not, this path is not working for them. I don't know which it's gonna be, but I'm fighting for it to be the second. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Um, I, I know there's a number of other questions that uh, have come in, I think, just a testament to, to the, the, the quality and thought-provoking nature of the presentation. Um, I don't know, Paul, um, Paul Lynham, um, if you want to maybe just put those questions to, to Adam. Yeah. Thank you. Adam, we, we've received 10 questions, and I know we have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to try and... I'll try to be much briefer. I'm sorry. 
No, no, no. Whatever, whatever works. Uh, some, some, some obvious themes that are coming across. You've mentioned Irish unification. Somebody has asked. Uh, I suppose the broader question. One person asked about does it jeopardise the rest of the United Kingdom, and then somebody's been more specific about Scottish independence. Uh, and as a result, if, if Scotland is is on the line, do you believe that political behaviour of London will change? Uh, and where does that position the UK-EU political and trade relationship? And on top of that, somebody said, well, you've dismissed a UK-US trade deal. Um, but where do you see a potential uh, US-EU uh, trade deal? Uh, are we going to be waiting quite a while or is that going to start moving up uh, the agenda? So maybe that question first. And then we've got one about you know advice you'd offer for various different governments. So uh, we'll see how you get that one with that. Okay, so quick, so lightning round. Um, first one is um, uh, Scotland and UK unity, rest of UK. Um, when I was at Bank of England and more recently after that, I was very opposed to Scottish uh, separation or secession or whatever, independence, whatever you're going to call it. Um, economically, it makes absolutely no sense for Scotland, and it's not a great thing. Obviously, UK no longer being in the EU changes that calculus for Scottish voters, but I'm pleasantly surprised that, at least in the polling data, uh, it looks like um, demand for another referendum and demand for independence is already crested. So basically, I think the Irish situation is not likely to have many spillovers for further breakup in the UK. Um, if anything, as we saw with the EU, once the UK left, the sense of central spirit in the EU went up and I would expect issues in Northern Ireland to increase the sense of unity. And one would think the willingness of even the Johnson government to accommodate Wales and Scotland and the regions to keep the rest of it together. Um, but I, I mean, obviously there are political non-economic factors who can come in, but for me, this, the, that's the way it works. Um, in terms of US, UK, I already dismissed that, as you said, uh, US, EU, no. Um, so um, basically I wish they would be, the US should be doing trade deals with countries that have higher environmental and labor standards than the US does, which is hard. And so doing some kind of deal with the EU would do that. It also would be the most peaceable but effective way of confronting China. Uh, if the US and EU were to align their economies much greater and have more common standards and more common minimums and regulations, but there's absolutely no appetite for it in the US right now. And the diverging ways that the US and EU for at least the next few years are likely to approach decarbonization is going to make it even more unlikely that we get a US EU deal. I, again, I hope to be proven wrong. But in addition, Ambassador Tai, the US Trade Representative, has made clear, and the Biden administration has made clear, they have no positive trade agenda at the moment. They have no, given the way Congress is, and they may like this, they may not like this, but given the way Congress is, they see no point in bringing any trade deals of any kind to Congress for the US right now. Okay, thank you very much. And another lightning round, if I will. Um, what advice would you give to the UK government to mitigate against the worst long-term effects of Brexit? Then while you're advising governments, if you're advising the Irish government in the post-Brexit, post-pandemic era, what advice would you give them to strengthen the Irish economy? This is obviously with the concern of, in relation to corporation tax uh, as well from an Irish perspective. And then somebody has asked, Ireland, the UK and the US all have debt to GDP ratios well in excess of 100%. How worried should we be and how vulnerable are we? Okay, thank you. So first was, um, advice to the UK government, um, I would do unilateral liberalization vis-a-vis uh, -vis the whole world. So we're getting back to the Corn Laws debate as my friend uh, in the Byline Times is writing about. Um, you know, it, it would, you don't have to do it specifically with respect to the EU. Um, make the, you want to do global Britain, do global Britain. Um, and if you're going to end up, don't do a race to the bottom on trying to get oligarch money and uh, financial services with low standards, because that'll just backfire on you and you'll end up getting treated like Luxembourg or something um, in due course, or the Cayman Islands. So 
Um, those would be the main things. Um, I also, obviously, there's the issue of skills, which the UK has been gnashing its teeth about for 150 years. Um, the move to colleges under Tony Blair universities did not work well for addressing that, but nothing since it's even been tried. So I think you have to rethink very fundamentally the education system in the UK. Uh, it's, un it's uncomfortably like the US. You have global high standard universities that serve the top students extremely well. You have a limited number of uh, apprentice and, and, and uh, artisanal and tech trades training that could be expanded a lot, but hasn't been. Um, in terms of Ireland, uh, as I said on a relatively well listened to Irish radio podcast a few months ago, you know, you've had a very good run. You've ripped off the rest of the world on taxes for a couple of decades. You put it to good use. It's been very nice. You overdid the Bob the Builder phase for a bit, but on balance, Ireland's been wonderful. The run is over. And if you try to keep it going, you're just going to get nothing. So it's taken the world a very long time to get to minimum corporate tax standards and journalists to get on this, but it's done. So Ireland should continue to take advantage of the other strengths it has, its workforce, its location, it being an alternative to the UK that's now outside of the EU, its membership in the EU, uh, its high quality agricultural products, its, its ability to do financial services, you can do a lot. But you're just gonna wait. You're just gonna have to accept that you're not gonna get this kind of revenue benefits in the rest of the world anymore. I'm sorry. What was the third question? <laughs> I think we're, we're still digesting the last one. Um, Ireland, the UK, and the US have debt to GDP ratios oh, yeah. in excess of 100 percent. Everyone, everyone can relax. I mean, I can explain more, but I thought we we're out of time. So I mean, the bottom line is everyone can relax. The bot, you know, if if You'll notice that during the uh, global financial crisis, the issue for Ireland was not its public indebtedness, it's, it was its private indebtedness and real estate issues. Um, and when the Irish government spent money to recapitalize the banking system and took on debt to help its people after the initial crash, the interest rates came down rather than went up. The same is true now. As my colleague at Peterson, uh, Olivier Blanchard, has been writing about the fundamental drivers of debt sustainability are different than what people used to think. The key ratio in numerical terms is what we call R minus G. That is whether the growth rate of the economy exceeds the interest rate on long-term public debt. And we live in a world for a variety of reasons, including some bad ones, where globally interest rates are very low. And so even normal growth is higher than the debt. So no, you want to get to, just as the US should and the UK should, real debates about which forms of public investment and spending are worthwhile or not, but don't fixate on the debt to GDP ratio. It doesn't tell you anything. Okay, well, that, that's me. Thank you. Well, if I might say, uh, thanks very much, Jared, uh, for hosting. And thank you, uh, Dr. Buzz, and I'll come back in a moment. But Jared, to you and your colleagues at Evershed Sutherland, I uh, see Claire on the line, uh, and to the rest of your colleagues, thanks so much for uh, being with us today and for supporting this, uh, this uh, expert policy series. Uh, Paul, you might just briefly mention, when is our next event in that regard? You're on mute, Paul. Uh, next Thursday at 10.30 uh, a.m., uh, that's Thursday, the 14th of October, with, and it's, uh, Catherine has put it into the box, that is with the CEO of the European Banking Federation, Vimage, at uh, 10.30 next Thursday. Okay, so be there, or be square. Uh, another another great event, uh, and so informative. And uh, Dr. Posen, look, it's, uh, we're, we're reeling um, with uh, the numerous uh, quotable quotes. Uh, whether, whether they'll get printed up in the Irish Times tomorrow morning remains to be seen, but uh, you've given us a tour de force across the global geopolitics and the geoeconomics landscape. I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the concept of, being, of, of Ireland having ripped off the rest of the world on taxes, and I'm sort of equating that with the fact that actually we donated half our population barely a century to go to build the rest of the world in Britain and the US, uh, but you know, we, we're, we're, we're okay with that now. Uh, look, uh, all joking aside, uh, it's been really wonderful to have you with us, and I want to also 
thank our uh, our contributors, uh, our, our many questions. Uh, wonderful to have uh, another expert in the art, the dark arts of economics, one of Ireland's finest economists, Dermot O'Leary from Good Buddies with us. Uh, and a special welcome to Denise Walsh from the Chamber of British Irish Chamber of Commerce's newest member, Lakelands Dairies. Thanks so much, uh, Denise, for putting your support uh, and trust in us. Um, to all of the rest of you for your questions and your engagement, thanks for being with us today. Thanks to our own team, uh, Paul, Catherine, Neve, and more. Uh, and look, the most important people on the call are you uh, for joining us in the middle of very busy environments to tune in. I see Brian Hayes from the Banking Payments Federation. Good to see you too, Brian. But uh, the closing word to yourself, Adam, thanks so much for all your great work. Uh, thanks for stimulating us to think about important things in life. At the end of the day, uh, be it north, south, east or west, the thing that brings peace, and you did touch on the importance of peace, is jobs at the jobs that fuel peace and prosperity and well-being in the communities north, south, east and west on these islands and right across the globe. And thanks for helping us to think those things through today. Gurmila uh, Magdath, Salon Liv Galair, and we'll stay safe and we look forward to seeing you again soon at the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. God bless. Thank you.